Hello everyone, I am going to re-record the lecture for week 11 because we've had some technical difficulties and apologies for that. So what the point of this week's um, lecture is about writing your research report, which is your final assignment to do uh, for the course. And of course, what it's going to do is bring everything together. And I hope you enjoy the process of it. It's, it can be a little bit stressful, a little bit difficult, but overall um, it gives you a taste of what it is that you do from the beginning of a project right through to the end. You get a chance to, to complete it, to, to have this whole project that you've done, that you've finished. So that's what I want to, I want to just be talking about the report itself as well as some other comments on writing as well, although you're all senior students and pretty good at that. So it is about preparing you for assignment four. That's what this week's lecture is about, which is your final research report. And there are instructions and a rubric already on my uni. So writing up your research is not something that you do at the end. It's actually a key part of the entire research process, as you will already have noticed, I think. So it begins usually with a research proposal. We skip that. Um, but you certainly did an ethics application, but that's what I would do. I'd do a research proposal, I'd do a grant application, I might send emails to people, I want to be involved in a project, um, I need to do a literature review, then you give sem seminar presentations as you're going to be doing in week 11, and then you do an ethics application. And then, f so it's not like writing is the last thing you do. You've already been writing up your research in a couple of different forms, and that's entirely normal. So writing is therefore an ongoing planning process. It's a part of the collection of your research material, and it's building towards that final product, which in your case is a final research report. Um, often that's what it is for other projects. It, it ends up you might do an interim report. Um, and then a final report or several interim reports, and then a final report in other projects. It might be a book that's the final one. Um, that's what's going to be the case in the foster care project that I've been working on. We've got a book contract. So it can be um, the final product doesn't really matter how that form takes. But the point that I wanted to make is that writing is a whole part of the process. It's not just that final product. Um, it's an iterative process. So you're writing. Uh, and you're repeating, you're writing, you're rewriting, you're revising, you're editing. And I'm sure that many of you um, found that through the ethics process, that the writing and the rewriting you did for that gave you a lot of clarity on what it, you wanted to do. Uh, so you get a little bit clearer about your thoughts, your ideas um, on the way through, as well as in that final report of things suddenly emerge or you can bed things down in a way that makes sense. So there's a number of ways in which I think about writing and one of them is iterative, that you're repeating, you're going over and over again. Um, it's also generative. Uh, you, you can be writing to discover what you think or what you mean. And you may well have done that in terms of both the literature review and the ethics application. Um, you write to discover what it is that you actually want to do for the, your project. When you have to do an ethics application, you have to get down to the tin tacks of what it is that you that you want to do. It has to be become explicit. Um, and therefore, you, we understand that a little ourselves a little more in that process. So, that's uh, generative is also another way of thinking about writing when it comes to research. And it's also constitutive. So, what I mean by that is that you are constructing a particular view of reality, and uh, we all do that. If we're going to be putting material out into, you know, once we've written something, then that's a particular um, perspective on life, a particular perspective perspective on social life so and that can be very influential and if you think about a number of the theorists that we use on the way through then they've constructed a particular view of, of reality and their view is is it extraordinarily influential so you can think about that as well and you will shape people's thinking and i guess in this case the person's um thinking that you'll shape most will be yourselves and and me as the marker but if you're putting it out into the public domain then obviously you'd be sh um, shaping the views of a wider group of people um you're also writing up your research 
to explore and explain the social world and, and as I said it's going to be your particular view of the social world and so it pays to bear that in mind that this is according to your findings. So uh, I think we've discussed that before that um, from my perspective the idea of objectivity is a, is a very fraught one. I don't think it is possible to be completely objective so I think we always need to take into account that um, when we're exploring and explaining the social world we are doing it from our perspective even if we've taken into account lots of other people's perspectives as well. What you're also doing is persuading your audience that your view is accurate and that comes down to the style of writing that you'll use and, and often um, I hope you've noticed that as, uh, academic writing is quite assertive so that the person who's writing about their particular view of the world is kind of insisting that that's the way to look at it um, and so that's the way in which I encourage you to write as well in a very assertive way that your view is is an accurate one you want to do and engage in an, a persuasive piece of writing. It's a really, really good idea to aim for clarity um, and the test for that I think is friends and family who don't um, know what it is that you're writing about and, but if they can get what you mean um, then you've done a really good job. They might not be able to tell you that all back if they don't understand all the bits and pieces but at least if they do that first level of understanding where they can say yeah I understand what you mean that's a really good test for clarity. There shouldn't be anything mysterious about the text. You should be laying the points out one by one so that the reader reaches the same conclusion as you do. And that's part of being persuasive, that you lay out the argument all the way along. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, if, if somebody else did the proje same project, they might come to a different view. But the way in which you write is to... Um, is to, I guess, encourage the reader to think exactly the same way as you do um, in terms of this particular project because you're wanting to persuade your reader that your view is accurate and therefore you lay out all the arguments so that they do reach the same conclusion. If you leave things implicit, so implied rather than explicit, um, then chances are they might not. So you lay everything out, including your graphs. It should have little comments on them, so that when you look, at, when somebody else looks at the graph, they see what it is that they, you want them to see. So the idea of authorial voice, I've already alluded to, is that you write in a way that's persuasive and assertive. Um, so you have less. Um, you're not tentative about it. You're, you're going to be, it's, it's kind of a tone that you know you've done this project, you know you've done it well um, and so you were saying with the evidence that you've got this is the particular view of the social world that is accurate given the project that you've done. Um, in terms of projects that I do using the first person or I, it's often not okay um, but I think it is okay as long as it's not overdone. It certainly demonstrates that you are a part of the research process and I think that's important. So when I, when I work in a team, I, I guess we talk about we, we as a team do something, but the, the individual task that we do is, is, is hidden. Um, and sometimes you can even hide the fact that you were a part of the research process. And I think it's more important to include yourself. It does demonstrate that you were a part of it. Certainly in terms of methodology, that should be there. Um, that you did it. Um, I don't have to use the royal we or uh, or not have yourself included there but just don't overdo it. I think it, just a moderate amount of I is, is fine. Um, that seems okay to me. And I want, I'm going to talk about this a little bit um, more but generally write in what I'm going to call an active voice rather than a passive one. But I just want to point out that both of these but around the first person and around the active voice rather than a passive is very much discipline dependent. So you might find in some areas that it's not okay to use either of those or one of those. And I'll explain more about the active voice as we go along. It's a really, really good idea to use the 95% rule. Um, so you don't have to do what I'm saying all of the time. There may be some times when um, it's a good idea to um, to use the passive voice and I've found myself doing that in a paper where I was jointly writing a paper with somebody 
but I didn't do the actual research part of it. I did the writing up part of it. That was my job. And so when I wrote up about the research, I wrote in a way that hid the fact that I didn't do it. There was only one part of it, one of us doing it. And I was okay with that for that example. Um, so that's just where I go with a 95% rule. Whatever I tell you, there will be some exceptions sometimes where you don't um, want to do or you, you're told to do things differently anyway. So with the... The idea with active and passive is the emphasis. The emphasis in active is on the agent um, who's doing it. In the second passive example I'm going to show you, the you is missing, so you dis so the person disappears. So this is way, one way in which scientific writing can actually appear more objective. Sometimes it might be that you want to focus attention on the research um, or the experiment, or not who's doing it. And in the example that I gave you, I wanted to hide the fact that only one of us did the research component of that particular one. And so therefore, I used, I did, we, I did not use the um, an active way of writing. I was able to hide it. But think about that, that one of the ways in which scientific writing can appear to be more ob objective, it can be about the way that it's written, not about whether it's actually objective or not. So in the first example I've given you, I gave all participants a copy of the information sheet along with the survey questionnaire. So that's writing in the active voice. In the passive voice, um, the, pa the participants were given a copy of the information sheet along with the survey questionnaire. Um, so the fact that you've given it has suddenly disappeared. Um, you, you, uh, yeah, well, I've, I, um, the fact that I gave it has now disappeared and it, it could, it could have been anybody. So it's a much more passive way of writing. Uh, so the agent in the first one has, 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 um, has disappeared and that, that's my point. Um, but in some ways that second one can look more formal. The passive voice looks more formal. It seems that many much academic writing is written in that way. I'm not going to penalise you if that's the way that you prefer to write. Um, it's just that the reason why I raise the active voice versus the passive voice is because active writing is often a lot more energetic and a lot more lively than a whole lot of passive writing. So it can actually just be a better read for the reader. However, I'll leave that up to you. And again, remember that 95% rule. You've got to be thinking when you're writing about who's going to be reading it. So even though I've suggested active versus passive, there'll be some disciplines where they're even inclined to be far more formal than that. But I do want you to use formal language rather than colloquial or everyday language. So there still is a shift. It's not You're not going to, even though I want you to aim for clarity and the piece of work be something that your friends and family who know nothing about what you do um, can understand. I still want it to be a little bit more um, formal than the, the language that you would use um, in talking with everybody, but you would know that. So formal language has some quite specific things, transition signals, signalling that you're moving from one topic to another, long noun phrases which allow you to be quite specific in your case about the particular sorts of students that you're going to be or have researched with, evaluative language which we've talked about which allows you to make a judgement about particular work and a very respectful tone. So they're kind of the features that I that I actually I will be looking for. Um, you do need to consider your audience and their level of assumed knowledge. So um, that's important. So for example, you wouldn't tell your research participants that your analysis is epistemologically grounded in a post-structural analysis that uses Foucauldian theory to critique hegemonic discourse about international student. However, um, if you're writing to me, yes, you could absolutely write that. Um, and if you were writing, um, if your research participants were academics, then you could probably write that as well. So this is just a general comment about writing that you do need to consider your audience and how much 
um, information you need to give them. In my case, when you're doing writing for me, what I'll be assessing is your understanding. So if you were to write something like this sentence, then I would like a little bit more information after that to show me that you understand what epistemologically grounded in a post-structural analysis actually means. So make sure that when you're writing, you're explaining enough to let me know you understand terms and aren't just plucking them out of a textbook and using them. Um, and as I pointed out, you could actually use that sentence in a research report intended for university executives. So it depends on who who your audience is. So I would never have used a sentence like that if I was going to be um, writing a report for an external um, agency that had hired me, for example, to do some research. I wouldn't do that. I would put it in a way that made it a little bit clearer uh, what it was that I meant. Um, but for research, um, you know, other research um, academics or um, other academics at the University of Adelaide, then yes, I would include that sort of sentence. The structure of any report is discipline dependent. Um, there is a good guide at the, at the Writing Centre and I hope you found their learning guides. There's guides in the textbooks as well. Um, Basically, all reports kind of have the same information in there, even though they might vary on some of the uh, order of it. For example, sometimes I've seen the methodology at the end of a project and not at the beginning of a project, so the order might shift. But basically, they all kind of have the same, same stuff in there. So you'll need a, a title page, um, the title of the project, which kind of sums up. You've already got yours, but sums up project and if you need to revise your original title do that if it doesn't really fit anymore um, often titles academic titles are a two-part stru uh, structure so you might start off with something catchy and then after the colon it's a little bit more descriptive you're welcome to do that so if you think your title has changed to your project that's okay that's all part of the the um, iterative process of revising um, and editing as you go anyway. You're not held to your original title. Make sure you've got your name and your student ID there, um, ID there the name of the intended recipient, which in this case is me, the course name and the date. So just basic details that outlines who it's going to who it'd be going to and who it's coming from. It's a really good idea to have a table of contents so that um, your reader can flick through. They don't have to read the whole lot. They can flick through to um, the relevant bits for them. So I'd encourage you to learn how to do one of those if you haven't got one already. I do want you to have a, an executive summary. It's a brief summary of the project. It could also be called an abstract. It shouldn't be very long. Most executive summaries would only be a page at the maximum for a very long report. I would expect quite a sizable report to come with a page. Um, but normally I'd be thinking of only for your sort of project around 100 to 200 words. So it's a summary and you should be able to summarise your entire project very briefly. Um, so it is the synopsis of your research question. It should include the rationale, the theory that you've used, your research methods and your findings. So you need to learn how to write quite succinctly for that. You might need to edit that a few times over. You should be able to sum all of that information up quite briefly in, in just those few words. Usually um, an executive summary or an abstract would cover the purpose of the report, the scope of the project, what's covered and what is not, the methods that you've used um, to, you know, to, to gather together your findings, the major findings, not all of them, just what you think stands out in particular, and then your main conclusions. Again, you might have several conclusions, but the main one. So that's what you should at least have in an executive summary. Because you don't have a lot of words, you need to do that quite concisely. So if you can imagine that that's just you're giving a snapshot, a little bit of a picture, and then the report comes along and fills in all of the details. And I guess it's called an executive summary because some people will only read that much. They won't read all of the detail. If you're making any recommendations, add those in as well 
very briefly in your abstract. In your introduction, so the, the purpose of an inter introduction is to talk about the research question, why your research question is important, and think about there again about your gap. Um, think about these are, you know, kind of you don't have to, might not include every one of these, but um, these are guidelines. Um, what's been gained from doing the project is really important as well. Have you found out something new? Have you consolidated pre previous research? Um, you do need to, for your project, do a brief summary of your literature review, which is 250 words, which kind of sums things up for your reader. In a usual research report, you would have your literature review in there, or at least a version of it. Um, so much more detail than I'm asking for because we're under limits um, for words. Include a statement about where your research fits within the existing literature. Um, so you might have done something that's quite new, something that's a previously unexplored feature of the student experience, or you might have done something that was uniquely about Australia or uniquely about the University of Adelaide. So include a statement about where you fit within that broader project of a literature review. You do need to mention your ethics process, um, and so there you would just talk briefly about the fact that your project had been approved, by the course ethics committee. That's kind of all that you need to do. Definitions, important to have your definitions in there. Be very clear and, and you have a little bit of scope with definitions to add in what you want to do. Make sure that you finish your introduction with a bit of an outline of the report that's coming up. So what I'd call a roadmap. So remember what I said about nothing mysterious. So you want to talk at the end of your introduction, you want to talk about what I'm going to find when I read these. So for example, I first outline the mixed methods methodology use, followed by the key findings from this approach. The significance of these findings are then explored and I conclude by making a number of recommendations for further research. Now I regard that as the bare minimum of a report map, um, excuse me, of a road map. Um, that's just the bare minimum so that I know that first of all I'm going to read about the methodology, then I'm going to read about the findings, then I'm going to think about the significance of those, that's what's going to be presented, and then I'm going to be reading about recommendations. So I know in advance when I start that the end of, by the end of the introduction exactly what it is that is coming up so there are no surprises. And so just on that point, at no stage in the report should I read something that I haven't been alerted to at some point earlier. Shouldn't be anything coming out of the blue. Your methodology, um, the purpose of that, you, it's about your work, what you did, why you did it, how you did it. That's where you would talk about epistemology, theoretical framework, the methodology which was mixed methods and the particular methods that you use. So many of you will have all the same things in terms of mixed methods, methodology, a survey and, um, and three interviews. Some of you might have come from a positivist epistemology and you talk about that. Some of you from a constructivist that you talk about that. And many of you will be coming from a citizenship theoretical framework. Some of you though have gone outside of that and have um, included some, some other sort of theoretical framework. So that's where you put all that in there and how all that ties together. Great idea at this point as well to talk about the limitations. Your limitations might include things like your time limit. This is just one course um, that you weren't, didn't have access to a wide range of students. Um, that um, other limitations might be that you chose a project maybe that was too narrow and therefore you wouldn't get as many responses as if you had a wider group of, you're able to sample a wider group. There might be some other limitations that you've thought of on the way through and so that's where you'd put them and it's perfectly okay. Every research project has limitations. The important thing is to set them out. Then you go on to describe the procedure or the methods that you followed, what you actually did. And this is description. You describe for me um, how you designed your survey, whether it was paper, whether it was online. Um, you would include the survey itself in the appendix. Um, and then you describe putting it online or however you, it was that you got people to complete that survey. 
Um, so all of the procedure that you went through, the same with your interviews. How was it that you recruited them? Where did you go and meet them? Um, Etc. You describe what you actually did, and it is just description. So, so you distributed the surveys via um, blah blah blah, and received back 70 responses or, or whatever. The interviews. Here's your guidelines. You can get conducted how many, where you did them, how long, whether they were recorded, or whether you made notes. So it's just revisiting what you've done, the actual process, and letting your reader know so that they've got an idea of what it is about how you went and, and gathered this information. So that's your methodology. Your results and your findings. The purpose of this is to show what the result was of the research that you conducted because that's really important stuff. So with the surveys, I want to know how the data was analysed. And then I want some illustrations using charts. Um, and that's mandatory. You just have to have charts within your um, within your report. They can be very, very simple pie charts. They can be much more elaborate, but they must be charts. If anybody has any difficulty with charts, do come and see me. They're actually quite easy to do, happy to help. But you must have charts. You must also have, um, before I go on to interviews, you must also have a little synopsis of your chart as well. So you have your chart, but then you have a little bit of prose telling me about your key findings. And don't put all of your findings in there, put the key findings in there. Um, with your interviews, again, you talk about how the data was analysed, whether you used thematic analysis, which many of you will have done, whether you used um, the categories of analysis that you found in your literature review, and again, you can illustrate using charts if you want to, if you've done a content analysis, the number of people who said this, that, or the other thing. Um, but then you illustrate by presenting the themes that, and um, the descriptions. So you might put down first in family, students at university, for example, some themes may be lack of support at home, um, not understanding university culture, um, um, there might be a theme of persistence in the face of difficulty. So you'd put down your th three themes and then you'd do a little bit of description around those and include some quotations because quotations are fantastic. If for me, they really enliven research. I like to read what people actually say. The purpose of your discussion is to pull together, to synthesize all of the preceding information. So you interpret your results. What does this all mean? And what does it mean in relationship to the literature that you uh, review that you did so long ago? Have you found something really new that's not encoding, that's not been found in the literature? Have you found, have your findings just accorded with what's already um, been found in the literature? And that's fine if it, if it does. Um, but you'd need to be able to interpret it, this. You describe how what you did answers your research question. And if it doesn't, that's fine. You might just say um, that it suggests that you need to do further research if you don't think it has answered. You draw here on your theoretical framework to put all that into perspective so that if you're using citizenship theory and you're talking about first in family university students, um, then you might make a note that differentiated citizenship requires that first in family students be given more support on campus so that they can come up to speed um, and not have the, not not be disadvantaged by the fact that there aren't people at home who can help them. So that's where you draw on your theoretical framework to make sense of your finding. An example I've got here is by considering, I'm thinking about standpoint, by considering the standpoint of students, I've demonstrated that a sense of belonging, which is a key aspect of citizenship, is rarely experienced by this particular section of the university community. Uh, so that's how you would draw everything together, including your theoretical framework. Your conclusion, the purpose of that is then to do a summary of the entire report. You summarise the why, you did what you did, what you did, how you did it, and your findings. 
and in particular you summarise what knowledge has been gained by the project. And think there about the implications for practice or policy. So the example I gave with first in family students may well um, to make a difference to the policy level at a university as well as practice level putting in place. I, th I think things like um, over time lots of practices at the university have been in response to first in family students and what we find is that whatever helps that group of students helps all students anyway. So things like the writing centre where they can help is a, is a policy and a practice particularly for first in family students but also for international students as well. So think about the implications and think about how you might like your knowledge to be used to generate change. Is there, what you've been doing is really pilot research or exploratory research. Is there some further research that you think would be useful? The conclusion is the place to put that. And if there are recommendations that you want to make, add those into the conclusion as well. So now we're up to the final section. So in this section, I would expect to find all of the references not the, all of the references that you um, used in the entire project, but all that you've used in the report. And in the appendix, I'm looking for the consent forms, the survey instruments you've used, the code books for the quantitative analysis and the qualitative analysis. So what I'm looking for there is evidence that you've actually done this research project evidence that you've inter interviewed people, evidence that you've conducted a survey, evidence that you've done some analysis. And so there you have it. That's all you need for your final report. I hope that you do enjoy putting it all together. It's a, it's a really important document and um, it's uh, a way to wrap up the whole semester as well as your um, project. Thanks for listening.